Um, as we continue with our lecture series, you get me twice today. And so to this afternoon, we're going to be talking about Alone in the Desert, Christian Monasticism in the Middle East. This is especially in preparation for our visit in a few days to the Sinai Peninsula, which is over there. We're passing it. We're passing in between mainland of Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. And someone was asking me earlier, um, the Sinai Peninsula is controlled, you know, it is part of Egypt, it is controlled by Egypt, so we're, we have a consistent presence on both sides in terms of Egyptian. But um, in the Sinai Peninsula, we will be having a chance when we stop at Sharm el Sheikh to visit St. Catherine's Monastery, and we felt like it would be helpful for us to give you sort of a background. Most of us don't have a lot of exposure to monasticism. You know, why would people do that? You know, why do people go into the desert, give up um, marriage, give up any sort of physical relationship with the, you know, and, and give up everything they own? And we want to talk about that a little bit, and then specifically to talk about St. Catherine's Monastery, so you'll have some idea what you're looking for, uh, looking at when we get there. All right? Now, I want to start out by saying that virtually every religious tradition in the world has a monastic tradition. Um, the saffron robes of Buddhist monks, this is a Hindu monk. Here we have a Jain monk, J-A-I-N, if you're not familiar with that. It's a, it's a fascinating religion. In fact, this also are Jain monks. Now, if you I don't know how well you can see that. If that looks like two naked guys, it's two naked guys. Oh. Because the, most, the strictest of the ascetics within the Jain religion are called Digambaras which literally means sky-clad, and the Digambaras are so ascetic, give up so much, they don't even believe in owning clothes, and so they go around naked. And that's a standard part of the strictest, the, the Jains are actually have some of the strictest ascetic or self-denial kind of uh, beliefs in terms of their monastic order. And so the Digambaras wander around um, in India naked, and everyone understands that, that they are the ones most dedicated to their faith. We also have Taoist monks from China. There are Shinto monks from Japan, Shinto being the national religion of Japan. And I don't have any pictures, but I've got this uh, jar and scroll here because in the ancient Jewish faith, there were two kinds of monastic orders, if you will. One of them were the Essenes. And you will have heard of the Essenes because they're the ones that wrote down the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were found, of course, in the 1940s and into the early 50s because they found them in more than one place um, in, in the, the desert. And the dry is what preserved them. But the Essenes were an ascetic monastic community. And then also there was the rite or the order of the Nazarites. Now that's not Nazarene. Jesus was born in Nazareth, so he was a Nazarene. But the Nazarites were an ascetic order. They did not cut their hair. They didn't drink alcoholic beverages. Um, they lived very simply, and the best example we have of that, there are several examples in the, in the Old Testament, but is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who lived out along the Jordan River, wore very simple clothes, ate honey and wild locusts, and uh, was kind of a wild man. He was a follower of the ascetic order of the Nazarites, and so the Jewish faith also has that tradition. But one of the richest traditions for monastic life is within the Christian faith. In particular, we're talking about that because the original home of monastic Christianity is Egypt. Monastic Christianity began in Egypt. And throughout the 2,000 year history of Christianity, monasticism has been a major influence. Now, the earliest Christian ascetics, or uh, monks, now, and by the word, the way, the word monk and monastic and monastery all come from the same Greek word, which is monikos which is based on the same root as mono, and you know what mono means? Alone, single. Because the earliest monks lived a solitary life. They were the hermit monks, sometimes called anchorites or eremitic monks. Eremitic is where we get the word hermit. Hermit, hermit, okay. So here in Egypt, the earliest uh, Christian monks began in the first three centuries during the time of the Roman persecution. The earliest of the monks in the first three, well, actually in the first four centuries, wrote down some of their motivations, some of their experiences. They became known as the Desert Fathers or the Hermit Fathers. But they weren't just fathers. 
there were mothers as well. There were desert mothers. And in the writings of the desert fathers, there are several passages written by women. Uh, in fact, in the uh, 4th century AD, now we're talking about the Christian era, um, one visitor to one region in Egypt said there were 30,000 monks and nuns living in just one region in Egypt. Now, 30,000, as we said earlier when we were talking about the Nabataeans, 30,000 was a lot. That was more than the size of most cities at that time. The interesting thing is, the 30,000 number that's quoted, two-thirds of those were women who were living a monastic lifestyle in the desert. Um, again, the very first of those monks lived a, a completely solitary life. They actually had monks in Europe, anchorite monks they were called, and sometimes they would build a cell on the outside of a church and seal it up. There would just be one opening where food could be passed to this person, and, eat, and they would live entirely by themselves in one room uh, with a chamber pot, and they would spend their time in prayer and reading scripture, and people would come and ask them for spiritual guidance through that slot that they received food in. Well, once they started coming to the Egyptian desert, many of them would move to the outsides of towns. They would live in tombs, or they would live in huts that they would build on the outside of town. And then eventually, they began to move further and further out. This map, all of the places on this map, which is the, this is the Nile River, are all the locations of monasteries. Because while the first monks lived a solitary life, later on they started getting together and learning from each other. Somebody who had been there for many years and had lived a spiritual life on their own, other newer people who wanted to follow a monastic life would come and ask the experienced ones to help teach them that they can learn from their previous experiences. Now, the original monastic uh, person, by most people's estimation. Now, he was not the first monk, but St. Anthony, Anthony the Great, is widely considered the most influential of all the early monks. Um, he moved to the desert around 270 or 271 AD. Again, this is during the times of the Roman persecution. A lot of the monks were fleeing the persecution by the Roman Empire against Christianity. Now, Anthony's a fascinating guy because he was born quite wealthy. His parents were of, of means, and they died when he was about 20, and he inherited all their money, he and his younger sister. Well, when he was in his 20s, he heard a sermon preached that quoted the passage where the, young, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to be saved? And Jesus, knowing the motivation in this man's mind, said, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And Anthony felt like that was being said just to him. And so he did exactly that. He sold everything he had. Initially, he left some money in an account to take care of his sister. And then later on, he decided God can take care of everything. And he even sold that part. You know, <laughs> and it, I, I, I don't know what happened to his sister. Apparently, she got along all right. Um, and Anthony moved to the desert. At first, he lived in tombs close to a town. Later on, he felt like that was still too close to people when he was about 35 years old. Anthony moved out into uh, the desert and found an old fort that was abandoned. He sealed himself up in this fort, and he did not see another person's face for 20 years. People would come there, these, as I said, these other younger, less experienced monks would come there and sort of talk to him through the cracks in the door and ask his advice, and they developed sort of a community of people getting his advice through the cracks in the door but not seeing him, and they would throw him food over the wall. He lived like that for 20 years. During that period of time, he suffered great temptation. The temptations of St. Anthony are a major theme in early Christian art, and it continued down through the centuries. There are many different versions of this. Apparently, the story is told that he was, he was attacked by demons. The devil tempted him so much that he didn't even physically affect him. He would be bruised and wounded for days after these spiritual attacks. Now, one of the reasons we know all these things about St. Anthony is because his life story, the life of St. Anthony, was written by St. Athanasius. Uh, Athanasius was one of the great early leaders in the church. He admired Anthony. He wrote his life story. Athanasius himself even spent some time as a monk. But um, he wanted people to know about this great spiritual man who had committed himself to uh, serving, spiritually serving God. 
Well, after 20 years of being locked up in this fort and people kept showing up and asking him for advice through the cracks in the doors and windows, he finally agreed that he would come out and help those people and set up a, a monastic group. And so he left and spent the next six years after leaving the fort setting up a monastery. That monastery today still exists. It is the world's oldest monastery. It's the monastery um, Del Mar Antonius, which is in Egypt. Uh, it's along the, along the coast of the Red Sea. And that monastery has been responsible for, I think it's 12 popes have come out of that monastery. We'll talk about that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, he lived until, according to the records that we have, until he was 105 years old. To everyone's astonishment, for instance, after 20 years in a fort without seeing anybody else and just eating whatever they threw over the wall, they expected he was going to be emaciated and in terrible shape. When he came out, he looked like he was way younger than he was. Apparently, he was in excellent health, despite the fact that he was spiritually tormented and all of that. So, St. Anthony became a great model for those who wish to follow a spiritual path uh, in Christianity. Another man during that time as well was Paul of Thebes. This is not the Apostle Paul. Paul of Thebes, also an Egyptian. His life was written by St. Jerome, the same guy that translated the, uh, the Bible into Latin. Uh, and the, the life of Paul of Thebes is another inspirational story about the monastic life. Both of them, Paul of Thebes and St. Anthony, started out and their primary focus was solitary monastic life. It was only after many, many years of being bothered that Anthony finally agreed that he would set up a monastery to help others, but that was not his preference. The start of the monastic community movement, which is called Cenobitic Monastery, Cenobitic means common life, and that's the kind of, you know, we have very few solitary or hermit monks anymore, or nuns. Most of them now live in monastic communities. That really began with a man named St. Pacomius, which was uh, just slightly later, about the same time actually, but slightly later than St. Anthony. He comes along and Pacomius had been in the Roman army. And in the Roman army he had experienced what it was like to live in a barracks and to have a common, a common cafeteria, common public use areas, to, to live in a barracks. And so he and his younger brother John, after the two of them living by themselves for a while, Pacomius said he heard God speak to him and said, you're supposed to help people. And Pacomius' first response was, I don't want to help people, I want to serve God. But he kept hearing what he thought was a vision, an angelic voice saying, you need to help people. And so Pacomius created the first formal community life approach to monasticism. He wrote what's called a rule. Uh, he was one of the first people to write a rule or a set of directions for how to live a monastic life. This chart is actually taken from his descriptions. His rule included, here's what should be in a monastery. You know, you need to have a, refect a common refectory, refectory to eat at. You need to have barracks or cells. And he designed the whole thing. From that time on, almost every monastery that has been built, and this is a huge one, this is uh, Monte Cassino in Italy, have all basically followed the same strategy that Pacomius designed back in the late 200s and early 300s. So he was terrifically influential in terms of teaching them how to uh, live together, uh, what kind of facilities they needed, and also how they should live their lives in terms of the what's called the office, the monastic office. How much time you spend in manual labor, which was part of it, how much time you spend in communal worship, that is, worshiping together, and how much time you should spend privately in prayer and spiritual study. So Pacomius really set all of that out. Anthony did so reluctantly. Pacomius really felt that God had called him to do that. Now, when we talk about Christian monasticism, it's important for us to realize that there are two different traditions, and they really are quite different. Um, these are photographs, obviously, of various kinds of monks. The lower right hand is a good example of an Orthodox monk. The lower left, these are Catholic monks. The Roman Catholic tradition and the Orthodox tradition have developed very different ideas about what monasticism is. When we talk about St. Catherine's in a minute, it is an Orthodox monastery. Now, in the West, they spoke Latin, and the Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church in the West, which means in, the, in Europe, developed uh, the Latin liturgy, they developed an approach to monasticism, 
primarily based upon the rule, again, the set of instructions, of St. Benedict. And that's why you have probably heard of Benedictines. The Benedictine monastic order followed the rule of St. Benedict. In addition, there were a couple of reform efforts, because the Benedictines got kind of sloppy after a while. The Cistercians, the Trappist monks, were both efforts to try to do a better job of the Benedictine order. Those were both Catholic. In the Catholic order, there were three obligations or vows that a monk would take, or a nun. Those were obedience. That first means obedience to Christ, but that was seen as being represented by obedience to the abbot or the head of the monastic order. So when they say obedience, they mean you, you obey the people who are over you in the monastic order. Secondly, poverty. That varied from order to order as to what they were allowed to have. Generally, um, the abbot would allow them to have, for instance, um, a pair of shoes or sandals, a, a robe, or and a, perhaps a cloak, maybe some basic personal utensils, but generally it was a life of complete poverty and of chastity. You renounced marriage, you renounced any sort of sexual expression at all um, in order to be, in effect, uh, committing all of your energies and efforts toward your relationship with God. Now, it's also important to recognize there are two kinds of monks in the Western or Catholic tradition. One of them is a monk. A monk usually spent all of their time in a monastery praying. And then there are friars. You remember your story about Robin Hood. Friar Tuck, right? Friar Tuck made beer. The friars were a kind of monastic, or the kinds of monastic orders, and that includes the Franciscans, the, the Dominicans, the Carmelites. Their whole focus was serving the community, which Friar Tuck apparently thought making beer was part of that. Uh, the, the Belgian monks, for instance, were great for making beer. That's why you have such great, you know, Belgian beer. Champagne was invented by Dom Perignon, right? Dom Perignon was a monk because fermented beverages, since wine was used in communion, is always something that the monastic orders have specialized in. But the friars were oriented towards service and relationship to the communities. The monks in the Catholic tradition stayed pretty much in the monasteries and were not as involved in service. Now that's the Catholic side. In the 11th century, there was the great schism between the Latin Western Church with its center in Rome and the Orthodox Eastern Church with its center in Constantinople, which is today, of course, called Istanbul. There actually were multiple sites of a major focus in the Eastern Church. Constantinople was one, Antioch was one, that was where Paul and Barnabas um, sort of based their operations. Jerusalem was kind of honorary, and then Alexandria in, where is Alexandria? In Egypt which again is one of the reasons that Egypt has always been a center for this kind of Christian focus. Well, in the East, the, the Greek Orthodox focus, now whether you're talking about Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, which is you know Coptic uh, Orthodox Church in Egypt, whatever, the Orthodox Church has focused even more on the monastic tradition. Again, it began here. It began in the East, here in Egypt. In fact, there's a famous quote by St. John uh, Climacos, who is a, a saint in the Orthodox Church. He said, angels are the light for monks, and monks are the light for laymen. They were to be the example. And they, in fact, the Orthodox Church has always said that they can evaluate the health of the Orthodox Churches based upon the health of their monastic orders, their monks and nuns. If they are disciplined and spiritual and godly, then the church is doing fine. If they start slipping, they know they've got a problem. And so that's always been a focus for them. The Orthodox monasteries have not been as service-oriented for the most part. They still uh, believe in caring for the poor and needy, but they were not organized in that way so much as the Western and Ca or Catholic monasteries were. Um, the, the Orthodox monks have much more focused on what they call theosis, which means union with God. It is an entirely spiritual effort. But that doesn't mean they don't care about the world. They felt like if they can grow closer to God through theosis, union with God, then their prayers can be one of the most powerful things that they can do for the rest of the world. Uh, Orthodox monks typically have little or no contact with the outside world. Um, the last time Carolyn and I were on Patmos, which is an Orthodox monastery on the Isle of Patmos, the, you know, the monastery of St. John, there were a couple of monks who were sort of cleaning up and everything, and 
they did not look happy with all these tourists being around because as a rule their focus is on their own spiritual life not on interacting with the outside public uh, also while in the Western Orthodox monasteries they always have a certain rule they follow they follow the rule of St. Benedict or St. Uh, St. Augustine or others in the East the monasteries tend to be led by their own abbot or their own leader without following a unified kind of tradition the focus though still is on communal worship within the monastery, on manual labor, both for its own benefit as well as the spiritual benefit of working, and then private prayer and study. Now because monasteries have tended to, to be places where they go to get away from the rest of society, um, monasteries are quite often in very dramatic locations. Mount Athos and others, these are all Catholic monasteries, and you'll notice they're either in very remote locations or they're surrounded by high walls. You're going to see that when we look at images of St. Catherine's. Similarly, when you talk about Orthodox monasteries, they are either walled in or they're in very remote locations. And because they're in very remote locations, they're frequently quite beautiful. Of course, the lower right-hand side, the Orthodox half of Christianity has a much greater focus on icons, on iconography and images of, um, in, that they venerate as representing uh, divine images, all right? So, beautiful monasteries, and we are going to be visiting one of the oldest. St. Catherine's is not the oldest monastery. Again, that, that uh, title belongs to uh, the monastery of St. Anthony here in Egypt. But one of the oldest monasteries is St. Catherine's, and it is almost certainly the most famous of the monasteries for several reasons we'll talk about. Before I get into St. Catherine's, I want to talk for just a minute about why would somebody do this? What was the motivation? What was, especially back then, and what is today the motivation for people to enter into a monastic life, to basically give up everything, familiar relationships, um, the, the place in society, to give up any financial reward, all of the things that so many people in the Western world especially think are the main focus of life, they give these things up, so why would they do it? Well, the first reason is because uh, people in monastic orders believe that they are following the example of Jesus. You remember Jesus never married. Jesus, when uh, regularly during his earthly ministry, he would go off either into the desert or into the hills when he was around Galilee to pray, to spend time in uh, meditation and communion with God the Father. And so they feel they're following the model of Jesus. In addition to that, they're following the model of St. Paul, the greatest evangelist of the Christian church. St. Paul advised his, his readers when he was writing to the various churches that he planted, it's better for you not to marry so that you can focus all your attention on your spiritual life. Well, St. Paul believed, and he's, he's very clear about this, that Jesus was going to come back any day now. You know, be ready by Tuesday because he could be here. Uh, that has not turned out to be the case, but Paul still said, focus on your spiritual life as being most important. We also have the example of St. John the Baptist. As I mentioned earlier, John the Baptist was a sort of extreme ascetic, wearing very rough clothing, eating just natural foods that he found, following the rite of the Nazarite. All of these major figures within Christianity set an example of wanting to follow a spiritual life to the exclusion of the usual things that we think of as being important or a natural part of what our Western world is. Now, again, a motivation for a lot of these people, in addition to following these examples, is that for the first three centuries, for 300, just over 300 years of Christianity, the church was persecuted by first, first by the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem and later by the Roman authorities. And they understood this, the early Christians understood this as being a, an obvious example of Jesus' mandate that, that those who are going to come to the true faith will go through a narrow gate and very few will find it. And so they felt like by fleeing persecution, by focusing their life on the spiritual side, that they were part of those few who were finding the narrow gate. Now in the early 300s, something very dramatic happened. And that is Emperor Constantine defeated the other competitors, uh, including Maxinius, who, is the, who I'm gonna mention in a minute, uh, as, as having a responsibility for St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, but the Emperor Constantine came along in the early 300s and became a Christian, and said that Christianity was 
legal now. It was acceptable. There would be no more persecution. Now, he didn't make it the official religion of the Roman world. That came later under Theodosius. But he did say that Christians not only were acceptable now, but they were favored. He, it was uh, Constantine that called the first great council of the church in Nicaea in the 320s. And so Constantine comes along, and all of a sudden, it, not, it was no longer a case where if you were persecuted and serious about being a Christian, you had to flee persecution and spend your time in the desert. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people all of a sudden wanted to be Christian because now it was cool. It was acceptable. If you wanted to be part of the in crowd, then you followed this religion as opposed to earlier where you had to make a sacrifice if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus. And so um, we ran very quickly into a problem that bishops were vying for the most powerful positions. Um, this image, I don't even know what this actually represents, but this is sort of how a lot of people felt the church had gone. That bishops had all the bling. You know, they mm -hmm. used gold utensils, they wore jewels and, you know, golden threaded robes and all of that. Well, a lot of the people at that time thought this was the worst possible thing to happen to Christianity. That the idea that people who did it because of power or because it gave them wealth or it gave, you know, made them one of the people in the acceptable group. And in the 300s, after Constantine, there was a massive increase in the number of people who were fleeing this kind of attitude and wanting to become monks or nuns in the desert. And by the way, Egypt was the most popular place, but if you've ever, if any of you have been to central Turkey, Cappadocia, was another place where a lot of people went for, for monastic, um, you know, to, to get away, an ascetic life of monasticism. Some went to the Syrian desert. But Egypt be, it continued to be the focal point. And people said, there's something wrong with the church when this is what it looks like, and so therefore we are going to make sure our spirituality is pure by going to the desert and becoming ascetic monks. All right? Many of them felt like, they um, were doing that in order to overcome temptation, in, over, in order to no longer be victimized by the things that were drawing them into a worldly kind of situation. Now, the long-term result of that for the church was actually quite good. Uh, there were some struggles with some monks beginning to feel they were so spiritual that they wanted to take over. Um, and we actually had riots in some of the Egyptian cities, Alexandria at one point from monks who were so against the way the church was going. But the fact is that overall, the monastic orders did reintroduce, partly because of Athanasius and Jerome writing about people like Anthony the Great and Paul of Thebes, and talking about the spirituality of these people, they became an example. And they actually did, they were successful in reintroducing a, a better kind of serious, serious spirituality back into the church. Now, there's some things people have a lot of trouble with today, in the Catholic Church especially, that came from monasticism monasticism, for instance, celibacy. The idea of priests not being able to marry. This is one of the big questions that keeps coming up, especially every time they get a new pope. Well, celibacy became sort of the, that was the linchpin in terms of serious spirituality. If you gave up married life, if you gave up sexual expression, then that was seen as one of the very important signs that you were serious about your spirituality. And because that's what the monks had done, Eventually, the whole Catholic Church decided that as that sign of spirituality, they were going to institute celibacy for the priests. Now, I will throw this out. There was a period in there where um, some priests and bishops were actually having themselves castrated in order to no longer have those problems. The Council of Nicaea said, anybody that does that doesn't get to be a priest or a, a, or a bishop. So that sort of extreme was absolutely rejected. But eventually they did say celibacy was going to be something that all of the leaders of the Catholic Church would practice. And it's because of the influence of monasticism, ultimately. Okay, now let's talk about, for a few minutes, St. Catherine's Monastery. St. Catherine's Monastery, as I said, is not the oldest, but it's one of the oldest continually operating monasteries. It was built between 548 and 565 A.D. by the Emperor Justinian. Can anybody tell me what other building Justinian is most famous for? The Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. If you have never been to Istanbul to see the Hagia Sophia, it's worth going. That building was built in the 500s and it will still knock your socks off. Now for several centuries, it had been turned into a mosque 
after the Islamic forces conquered Istanbul, Constantinople, and turned it into Istanbul. But then in the 1920s, it was turned into a museum because Ataturk, in his effort to try to reform the Turkish nation and have better relations with the West, said having the most famous and largest church ever built at that time um, in Christian church ever built, having that as a mosque is probably not going to do anything for relations with the West. So he made it a museum, which he hoped would be seen as kind of neutral. But it's an extraordinary building. Justinian, who built the Hagia Sophia, or had it built, is also the one who had St. Catherine's Monastery built in the 500s. Again, it is one of the oldest of the monasteries. It is named St. Catherine's Monastery. Generally, that's what it's known as. But the official title is the Sacred Monastery of the God-Trodden Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, which is the mountain that St. Catherine's is built at the base of, is the traditional location of the burning bush that Moses saw when God called him to go back and to Israel and free the Israelites from captivity in Egypt. It's the, the, the traditional site where uh, Moses came back to after the Exodus to receive the law, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Jewish law. And so it has always been seen as one of the most important sites actually in all three of the major monotheistic religion. This is a holy site to Jews, to Christians, and to Muslims. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about the, the, uh, the fact that Muhammad gave them special permission to continue there, and this is an issue that's, continue, that's been raised in recent times. Now, it's called St. Catherine's Monastery after Catherine of Alexandria. She was a, a Christian woman who was martyred in the 4th century. Tradition says that uh, when she died, and she died under the persecution of Maxinius, the emperor in the early 300s that, that Constantine defeated in order to take over the Roman Empire. So she was martyred fairly late in the time period, in the early 300s, when there were still Christian martyrs. Um, she traditionally was killed by being broken on a wheel. I'm not going to get into the details of how that worked, because it's pretty macabre. But that's why often when you see St. Catherine, um, or St. Catherine of Alexandria is her full title, she is often seen with a wheel in the, in the image because that's how she died. Now the tradition says that after her death, the angels took her body from Alexandria where she died and transported it miraculously to Mount Sinai. And that then in the 800s, monks from the monastery of Sinai found her body. And it was from that point on that, that it was known as St. Catherine's Monastery in the vernacular. Again, the full title is the Sacred Monastery of the God-Trodden Mount Sinai. Um, the Orthodox Church venerates St. Catherine as one of the great martyrs. The Catholic Church um, sees her as one of the 14 holy helpers. Joan of Arc, you remember Joan of Arc, the French uh, savior uh, of the military? She claimed that she heard she had saints come and visit her. Well, one of the primary ones that came and talked to her, Joan of Arc, was supposedly St. Catherine. And so there's a long tradition of her in both the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. Now, how did, it, how did this end up being the place? Um, we have to mention St. Helen, or St. Helena. She's called by both names. St. Helen was the mother of the Emperor Constantine. She was a Christian. And in fact, after uh, Constantine became emperor and made Christianity okay for everyone, he named his mother, St. Helen, as Imperatrix, meaning sort of co-emperor, which meant she had access to the whole budget of the Roman Empire. She used some of that money to travel down into Palestine, the Holy Land. And along the way, she identified the locations and the actual physical elements that were part of the greatest traditions of Christianity and Judaism. In fact, um, she is so highly held, she, Constantine and Helen, that the Orthodox uh, uh, celebrate a feast, and the feast, which is in May, is called the Feast of the Holy Great Sovereigns Constantine and Helen Equal to the Apostles. That's the name of the feast. Constantine and his mother are considered by the Orthodox Church to be equal to the Twelve Apostles of Jesus. Now, when she was traveling through the Holy Land, this is Israel and all the way down into the Sinai, she supposedly in Israel, or Jerusalem, identified where Jesus was born, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, 
Helen was the one that decided that's where he, he was born and that's where to build the church. She's the one who identified where he was crucified. She was the one who identified, suppose, as we understand it, there's actually two locations now that they talk about maybe was the site of the crucifixion outside the walls of the, whole, the old city in Jerusalem. She identified where Jesus was ascended from on the Mount of Olives, which there is now a Church of the Ascension there. She came down to Sinai and identified where the burning bush had occurred. And that's why Justinian built the monastery where he did, because Helen, St. Helen, said this was where it happened. She supposedly found the true cross of Jesus that he was crucified on. That's why she is always pictured with a cross. Now, the story is that she wanted to make sure she had the right one, and they found three crosses. So she had a very sick woman, a woman at the point of death, brought from the city of Jerusalem out there, and the woman touched one cross, nothing happened. She touched the second cross, nothing happened. She touched the third cross, she was miraculously and instantaneously healed. So that's how Helen decided this is the true cross. And she ended up taking it back with her and divided it up. They say if you took all the slivers that are supposed to have come from the true cross, you could build a very large city. But the idea is they believe she found the true cross. She found the nails that Jesus was supposed to have been nailed to the cross with. And two of them she took back and she had one of them embedded in her son's helmet and one in the bit of his horse's bridle to protect him in battle. In fact, to be honest, St. Helen is accused by many church historians as being the one that, in, that introduced this whole idolatry of artifacts kind of thing into the church. Um, she identified other relics. She gathered up earth from the place where she said Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, had it taken back to the Vatican and spread in the Vatican gardens so that the blood of the martyrs would be as part of Rome, because she went to Rome even though she was living with her, her son in Constantinople. Um, and she, the claim was that she found the tunic of Jesus and the ropes that he had been tied to the cross with, and they're now in Cyprus. So this woman had a lot of influence. And one of the things she did was she identified that this was where the burning bush had occurred. This was where the law was given. And as a result of that, 200 years after she was there, Justinian had this monastery built. Now, there are a number of things about this monastery that are quite extraordinary. Uh, one of them is, if you go into the monastery, there is a king truss that holds up the roof. It is the oldest existing roof truss in the world. Um, gives you some idea of the age of this thing. As I said, this, this place is sacred to all three of the great uh, monotheistic <coughs> religions. You'll notice it's a fort, and that's because until the 20th century, not very long ago, no one was allowed in unless they were part of the monastery or part of the Orthodox Church. You can see that little box right there. It's kind of hard to see. The only way up until the 20th century you could get into the monastery would be by lift, being lifted up on a seat by ropes to get in because the only opening into the, into the monastery was there. Um, this thing continues to bother me. Uh, was through that opening. Now, that's not the case. In the 20th century, they opened it up so that you don't have to be lifted up by ropes to get into the place. Um, the Crusaders, when they were in the Sinai up until the late 1200s, they were so fascinated by this place, they went back to Europe and they started talking about it, and that started had, causing visitors to come. And so the monastery, like so many holy places, had the problem of having to deal with visitors. The church is part of Eastern Orthodoxy. That is the Eastern half of the Christian faith. Catholicism in the West, Orthodoxy in the East. Protestantism is a little bit of everywhere. You know, that came later. But interestingly enough, the, um, the church, the, or rather the, uh, the monastery, is part of the Orthodox Church of Mount Sinai. It is its own branch of Orthodoxy including a number of other Orthodox churches that are close by that are sort of descendant or dependency churches of this. They have their own archbishop, who is also the abbot of the monastery. And so while they are part of the Orthodox Eastern Church, they're an independent branch within that. And so they, they're not reliant upon authority from somewhere else. The monastery is famous for several other reasons. One are the manuscripts that are available there. This image is uh, from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew of the Codex Sinaiticus. Back in 1844, a German explorer and investigator called, named Konstantin von Tischendorf visited Sinai, went to the monastery, was allowed in, and as he was looking around, 
he discovered this codex. Now, a codex is like a book as opposed to a scroll. You know, it's made of folios that are often stitched together. This codex, Sinaiticus, is from the fourth, it was written in the fourth century, which means it makes it one of the oldest Bibles we have. It's one of four great unseal codexes. Unseal means all capital letters. There are no you know, small letters in this. The four great unseal codexes are Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus in the Vatican, Codex Alexandrinus, which was found in Alexandria, and the Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus, which I don't expect you to remember. But the point is, this is the most complete ancient Bible ever found. It is virtually all of the Bible, whereas the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Alexandrinus, the other two major ones, are only partials. This is probably a few years newer than Vaticanus and Alexandrinus, for instance, but it is complete. And it was revolutionary when they discovered this in the 1800s. I was having a conversation with Hans the other night about Bible translation. Um, the King James Bible is beautiful, but it's not a very good translation because we have things like this that was found in the mid-1800s that are much more ancient than the earlier documents that were used in doing translations of the Bible. It is critically important. This is probably the most important ancient document ever found. Then in the late 1800s, they found what's called the Syriac Sinaiticus, which is a, a palimpsest. That means that it was on a parchment that had been written on and then scraped off and something else written over it. Well, they have techniques now using, you know, very complicated x-ray technology and things like that. They've been able to identify that that is a Syriac version and a portion of the Bible that is even older than Sinaiticus. This is written in, as you can see, in Greek. I'm sure you all read Greek, right? Mm -hmm. This is a Greek language. So this codex is extraordinarily valuable, perhaps one of, well, certainly one of the most valuable ancient biblical texts ever found, and they found it here. Uh, in fact, they continue to find various fragments like that. As late as 2009, they found a, another piece of it that was missing. It was almost complete, but there were a few pieces missing. They're still finding aspects of this in the, the library uh, at the monastery. They have other documents as well. This is the actinomy which is the pat called the Patent of Muhammad. It is a document written by the Prophet Muhammad <coughs> giving them permission to continue as a Christian monastery at Mount Sinai. That is supposedly his handprint <laughs> on it. Now, whenever, since that time, whenever there have been more radical efforts within the Islamic faith to say, you can't have a Christian monastery here at the base of Mount Sinai, which in the Sinai Peninsula is part of the Holy Land of the, of the uh, Islamic people, they whip this thing out and go, Muhammad said it was okay for us to be here. And they go, okay, fine. You don't trump Muhammad in the Islamic faith. And so this gives them permission to continue as a Christian monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. There are a lot of other very ancient, very important documents, that, manuscripts there, uh, Sinai is also, Mount, the monastery at uh, Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's, is also um, where some of the most important ancient Christian art is maintained. They have mosaics, they have one of the very best collection of early icons. Now, the Christian faith in the East was based in Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire. Well, the Byzantine Empire went through a period in the 8th and then again in the 9th centuries, the period called the Iconoclastic Periods which meant they had religious leaders who were going through and destroying all of the icons, all of the religious paintings and symbols. Well, St. Catherine's was all the way down in Sinai, and they didn't get down there, which means in the rest of the Orthodox churches, there are no or very few very, very old icons. But here in St. Catherine's, they have uh, icons that go all the way back to the 5th century, so very early. Uh, again, the, the place was built um, in the 500s, so they have very old icons. Some of them are encaustic icons. This one here uh, looks like it's sort of drippy. That's because it's encaustic. Uh, one technique that they would use for icons in ancient times was to take beeswax and color the beeswax with pigments and then apply the beeswax to often wood or other materials 
in order to create icons. And so they have some of the best examples of encaustic ancient icons anywhere. Other liturgical objects like chalices, reliquaries intended to hold the bones of saints, um, extraordinary pieces of art. And again, one of the largest icon collections in the world. There are second only, in terms of manuscripts and certain kinds of the icons, they're second only to the Vatican itself and the Vatican libraries um, in, in that regard. And sometimes, like the, the crusade icons, there's a unique style of icon that was popular during the, during the crusades. They have virtually the only significant collection of crusade icons. So very, very significant artwork there as well. Somebody asked me today, would we have an opportunity when we visit there to go into the chapel? The answer is yes, I, I found out. Uh, at, at some points in their history, they have said, if you're not Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, you're not allowed into the chapel. We are allowed into the chapel. There will be icons on display in the chapel. There is also a museum where there will be icons on display. Now, they don't have guides in the chapel, you know, in the church. Uh, you're on your own, but there will be a lot of things for you to see in there. Otherwise, we will have guides on all of this. Um, and so this, and this gives you sort of a lay of the land in terms of where, where it is at the base of Mount Sinai. Any questions about either monastic orders and how and why this came to be, or about St. Catherine's? I will do my best to answer any questions. Anyway, yes? Okay, how do the Dead Sea Scrolls fit into this? The Dead Sea Scrolls I mentioned earlier were a product of the Essene community. In the first century, around the time, again, of Jesus and Paul and these folks, there were four major parts, four major parties, if you will, in Judaism. The Pharisees you've heard about, you probably heard about the Sadducees, the Zealots, one of Jesus' apostles, Simon the Zealot, they were ones who, from religious motivation, wanted to throw the Romans out or anybody else that was in charge. And the fourth group were the Essenes. They were an apocalyptic, you know, they expected the end of the world, they lived in a, a segregated sort of monastic kind of community. Well, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are, there are two types of Dead Sea Scrolls. Part of them are the Hebrew Bible. And some of it, for instance, the book of Isaiah, they have virtually the whole book of Isaiah, which is one of the long books, and portions of virtually all of the rest of the Hebrew Bible, what, we, what the uh, Christians would call the Old Testament. Um, so portions of all that, plus there are other Essene writings. The leader of the Essene community was called the Teacher of Righteousness. And so they have materials about the Essene beliefs there as well. These were found in Dag Hammadi, um, in a remote, dry part of the desert, in the 1940s and into the 1950s. Um, you may have heard the story. Apparently a, a shepherd boy was following one of his sheep and he threw a rock at it and it went into a hole which turned out to be a cave, and he heard pottery break when he threw this rock at his, at, you know, part of his herd. So he went to find out what that was, and it turns out that his rock had inadvertently hit uh, a jar, a clay jar, in which was sealed some of these documents. Well, they started looking in these caves, and they found in a number of caves, and over several years, this treasure trove of documents. But, again, these are only old, the Hebrew, uh, book, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Whereas when we talk about Codex Sinaiticus, and, and those, those were terrifically valuable in the 1940s and 50s, late 40s and, and 50s, they're still being used because those were from the very earliest you know, uh, time of the Christian faith. And so when they're trying to verify Old Testament documents or Hebrew Bible documents, the um, Dead Sea Scrolls are very, very valuable. There have been struggles over the years because the people who had responsibility for them didn't release them to other scholars for a long, long time, and so those are, that's been difficult. But the thing about the Codex Sinaiticus, for instance, is that not, not, not only is the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, but it's the New Testament as well. And when we say that it's from the fourth century, that means it's one of the oldest original documents that is a version of the New Testament. Yes? With all the celibacy, how did they perpetuate the race? Uh, by, with all the celibacy, how did they perpetuate the race? Um, yeah, well, talk, talk, to, talk about the Shaker community. You know, they were celibate and they're not here anymore. Well, the thing about the monks is that there were people who were actively desirous to be part of this, you know, to, to become part of the monastic order. So they didn't, they didn't have baby monks, but they had new people coming in, and that's still the case. People who come in and would join the order. And it wasn't easy. It's not like the doors were thrown open. For instance, Pacomius, 
Um, he set it up so that when somebody came to one of their monasteries to try to become a member, they were left outside the gate for two or three or four days before anybody responded to, to them. Because they wanted to know, one, they're serious, two, they're going to be obedient. When we say, you wait, then you wait. Once they came in, and this is this from this point on, it's true for all of the monastic orders, they enter a time as a postulate, which means they're not part of the monastic community yet, but they live there, they're expected to work, and then after a period of time, there's an agreement between the postulate and the people in authority, you know, the abbot or whoever's in charge, that yes, you seem to have a call to this, because this was seen as a divine call. You know, you had to be called of God to live this lifestyle. If they, as a postulate, if they were seen as being appropriate and they wanted to, then they would become a novice. A novice was sort of a junior monk. That's where we get the word novice. Um, somebody who's new to something. Well, the novice, they would be a novice for six to 12 months, as much as a year. And then again, if there was agreement, they would take temporary vows as a monk or none. After a period of time to be determined by the abbot, the person in charge, they would then go from temporary vows to permanent vows. And when they and so they had lots of chances to, to leave. When they were a postulate or a novice, they could still say, you know, I've decided that this isn't God's call on my life and I'm gonna go. And there were no hard feelings about that. Once they accepted permanent orders, they were expected to live there the rest of their life, to renounce the outside world, and to then be buried on the property. Part of a part of the idea of obedience was you were obedient to the call God has given you if you go so far as to accept permanent orders, okay, that you, you take the permanent vows. But again, they had a lot of people who were willing to do that because people who took their spirituality seriously felt like outside the monasteries, especially in the 300s and 400s, that things were so messed up in the church at that time that they felt like that if you're really serious about your spirituality, this is the place to be, the thing to do. That's hard for us to understand nowadays. Yes? How many monks are there now? I don't have a number. I don't know the answer to that, but we'll find out in three days. Okay? I, perhaps I can find out. Yes? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Did uh, St. Helen have any role in identifying the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Yes, she did. In fact, what, what happened was, when she got there, the Emperor Hadrian, they were still rebuilding the city of Jerusalem after the destruction by the Romans when Helen had got there. And Hadrian had come in, the Emperor Hadrian, and he had had a temple, and there's some question as to whether it was a temple to uh, Jupiter or a temple to Venus. She had that torn down, and the reason Hadrian supposedly built it there is because he was trying to obliterate this Christian site. Um, and she had it torn down and built the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on the place that she believed that Jesus was buried. You know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is his burial place. So yes, she was responsible for that as well. You know, there's very few places that you'll go in and around Jerusalem or the Holy Land that Helen is not the one who said, right there, that's where it happened. Okay, and they built churches there and because she had access to the budget of the whole Roman Empire, if she said, build a basilica right there, they built a basilica right there. No, there probably would have been nobody else who had both the authority and the resources to have done all the things that she did in that regard. Yes? Okay. That's true. Uh, during the Fatima period, and if you're here, if you're going to still be on board and you hear my talk about uh, Islam, what you need to know, the fourth caliphate of Islam, the caliph is a, a successor meaning the ones who were successors to um, Muhammad. The fourth official caliphate was the Fatimid uh, caliphate, which was Shia as opposed to Sunni. And if you don't know what that means, you're going to know when we, when we finish the, the class in a few days. Um, and they built a mosque inside the monastery. But they built it wrong. It's faced in the wrong direction. And because part of Islamic worship is you have to be able to face toward Mecca, the holy city, because the Fatima uh, Mosque inside the um, monastery is direct, is oriented in the wrong direction, it has never been used for Islamic worship. Huh. But it's still there. Okay. Any other questions? If I can be a... Uh, yes? What's that? 
Well, yeah, the translation of the, of the Sinaiticus is the Bible. And I recommend the international version myself. Um, <laughs> because that is that is simply the Bible we have. I mean, the Bible, the modern translations have used this document and others. Um, now, if you're interested in seeing these things, all of them have been digitally recorded and you can look them up online. If you go online and you look up Codex Sinaiticus, you can actually see what it looks like. Much of the Dead Sea Scrolls have been digitized and available online. The uh, Patent of Muhammad, the Atenement, is available online. So you can see what it looks like and zoom in and the whole thing. Um, that's been one way that they've been very modern in terms of making that stuff available to scholars and people who are interested, rather than have to trot it out physically every time, because obviously these things you know, become quite fragile over time. Yes, another question? Somebody have a hand up over here? Thank you all. Oh, yes? Well, the Greek word orthodox, and they have so many symbols, so many when they have their, their right. services. It, the iconography. Is that what you mean? I mean, the icons, the images? The icons and yes. all of that stuff. How does that differ if the Catholic has their, their way of doing it? The Greeks have their, but are they all? Well, the Orthodox Church, again, they went through two periods of iconoclasm where they said, we're not going to use icons. They are seen, and, and people in the West, Catholics and Protestants, have trouble understanding this. They do not worship icons. They see icons as simply ways to focus your attention on the things of God and the great people of God. So they're seen as focused to worship. They are not themselves worshipped or, or venerated in any more significant way. Now, the Catholic Church has always been much more fearful of the you know kind of things, and Protestants even more so. So we don't have icons as a focal point for our worship. But again, the, the Orthodox churches would say they don't worship them, they simply focus them, you know, they can focus their attention on the things of God. Now, when you say Orthodox, there's a lot of different flavors of Orthodox. I mentioned that the, the Monastery of St. Catharines is its own segment. It is the, the Orthodox Church of Mount Sinai, is what it's called. There is the Eastern Orthodox Churches, which include the big ones, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, etc. Then there is the Oriental Orthodox branch, which includes things like the Ethiopian Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, etc. I think the Armenian is part of, uh, of the Eastern Orthodox. And then you have smaller ones, like the Orthodox, you know, the Orthodox Order of, uh, of Mount Sinai. So there's a lot of different flavors in that. Just like when you talk about Protestantism, you've got Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and all sorts of things, all of them underneath that umbrella. The same thing is true in Orthodoxy. Catholicism is a little bit different in that it, mo all of that is much more unified within Catholicism because there's much more of a central authority. While there is a patriarch in, in Istanbul, Constantinople, who is, who is nominally the head of the Orthodox churches, he does not have the level of authority over Orthodoxy uh, in the same way that the, the Pope does over Catholicism. Okay? A couple more questions. Yes? The Coptic Church is Egyptian. Uh, the early Egyptian Christian churches was the Coptic Church. It still is today. There are Coptic monasteries. Um, the Copts actually, as a people, were sort of the lower echelon of people in Egypt. And so Christianity, when it came in, there was a strong motivation for those who were sort of suppre you know, suppressed in society to see this, remember I talked earlier about faith and culture, that this was a this was seen as a doctrine of hope, and people were excited about that. Well, the same thing was true, and so the Coptic Church is part of the Orthodox Church, you know, the Greek Church, but it is a small segment of it. And one more question, then I'm going to let you all go. Would somebody else have their hand up? Okay. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. So let's go to the